week of the Passion Week. We'll be back here again in Brisbane, in Australia, and also we're keeping our mass. So this mass today has been offered for Mr. John Benari, who died a few hours ago. And, uh, yesterday, and it's, uh, it's Wednesday morning here in Australia, but Tuesday morning, yesterday morning, just a few hours ago, uh, the John Benari died. And so we'll keep him in the prayers and this mass is for his intention. The epistle for this Wednesday in Passion Week, taking the book of Leviticus, chapter 19. In those days the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel. Thou shalt say to them, I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, neither shall any man deceive his neighbor. Thou shalt not swear, swear falsely by my name nor profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not calumniate thy neighbor, nor oppress him by violence. The wages of him who has been hired by thee shall not abide with thee until morning. Thou shalt not speak evil of the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind. But thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, because I am the Lord. Thou shalt not do that which is unjust, nor judge unjustly. Respect not the the person of the poor, nor honor the confidence of the mighty. But judge thy neighbor according to justice. Thou shalt not be a detractor, nor a whisperer among the people. Thou shalt not stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart, but reprove him openly, lest thou sin through him. Seek not revenge, nor be mindful of the injury of thy citizens. <clears throat> Thou shalt love thy friend as thyself. I am the Lord. Keep ye my laws, for I am the Lord thy God. And then the Gospel, take that according to St. John, chapter 10. At that time there took place at Jerusalem the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in Solomon's portico. The Jews therefore gathered round him and said to him, how long dost thou keep us in suspense? If thou art the Christ, tell us openly. Jesus answered them, I tell you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in the name of my Father, these bear witness concerning me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them everlasting life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch anything out of the hand of my Father. I and the Father are one. The Jews therefore took up stones to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, not for a good work do we stone thee, but for blasphemy, and because thou being a man makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God as it was addressed, the scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him whom the Father has made holy, and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not perform the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do perform them, and if you are not willing to believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I am the Father. That's for the words of today's Holy Gospel. about the fact that he's God and his enemies won't accept it. St. Augustine says, they ask him, art thou God? Art thou the Son of God? And he answers in words and he tells them the truth. And then they, or rather St. John Chrysostom says these things, 
And he says, and then he's, and then they say, since you, uh, since he answers in words, they say, well, then show us a sign. Show us a sign. Perform a miracle. So then he does miracles and he does good works. When he does good works, they say to him, well, tell us what thou art plainly. So if he does works, they ask for words. If he answers in words, they ask for works. And they go back and forth because they are filled with a great maliciousness. And we see this at the end of the fight. We're at the end of the great battle. At the end of the great battle, souls have already chosen. What side are you on? Some may smile and act like they're holy, but they have chosen what side they're on. We're past the middle time of the fight. We are at the time when you are either fully on the side of Christ or fully on the side of Satan. And God is going to show his power. He's going to say, I am God. He's going to show his power. And they pick up stones to cast at him. After the gospel verse today, they pick up stones to cast at him again. In the gospel a few days ago, they pick up stones to cast at him. But no stone flew from their hands. Why? Because he didn't will it. His hour had not yet come. And so he shows his power. He shows his power that his enemies have stones, his enemies have soldiers, his enemies have the power of authority on behind them, with authority of the government, his enemies have infiltrated Rome, his en enemies have infiltrated the court of Pilate, his enemies control everything, and therefore they want him dead, and they have chosen to apprehend him. And the apostles are very much aware of this great power of the enemies. And they say, Lord, that's why they say, Lord, let's not go back into Jerusalem. And after the gospel today, he goes to the place where John the Baptist preached. Just a short distance outside of the city of Jerusalem. And that's where he will be when the word comes to him that Lazarus is sick. And then he will say he's going to go back into Jerusalem. And the apostles will say, don't go because they tried to stone thee. They tried to stone him three times in a very short period. This is the second time. And there will be a third one just at the end of the gospel today. They try to stone him. They try to stone him. They try to stone him. But he is not ready to be stoned. He is not ready to be apprehended. Therefore, they have no power over him. Right now, if the devil had his way, he would end all of our messes. He would end all of our work. He would destroy everything that we do. Every single thing. He would cut it off completely. But God does not will that he be able to do it. And therefore, it is not done. Though he has complete control over the internet, he has complete control over the laws, he has complete control over the borders, he has complete control over the mass of men. And yet, he cannot stop the work of God. Because God is in control and showing His divine power. A hundred years ago, or a little more than a hundred years ago, the, our, the, our Leo the Thirteenth had a vision, very similar to what happened now in the Gospel today. He had a vision that saw that the devil would be released with a special power for about a hundred years. We're in that period right now. And we see that special power at this time, just before the crucifixion of Christ. There's more maliciousness in Caiaphas. There's more maliciousness in the enemies of God. There's more agitation in all the wickedness going on about our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of it, there's a fear in the followers of Christ. There's a trepidation that wasn't there a year before. They believed in Christ, and they despised the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now they believe in Christ, some of them, but they're afraid of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Just like right now, we believe in Christ, but we're afraid of the authorities. We're afraid of what might happen. But Jesus Christ is God. And this final argument is about his divinity, his divinity, his divinity, and his divinity. And St. Augustine says, we see he refers to himself very clearly in the Gospel of St. John chapter 10, and then also in chapter 8. He refers to himself very clearly as God the Son. The second person of blessed trinity. And a few verses after this, they'll argue again. Because the man who was born blind was just cured. It was just cured. 
that no man ever was ever born blind. They argue again. Is this man of God? They say, no, he's not of God. He's deceiving the people. But then others say, but no man from the, from the beginning of the world until now has ever cured a man born blind. Surely he must be of God. And they continue to argue about him. And they can't decide. There's an agitation in Caiaphas. There's an agitation in Annas. An agitation in the wicked priest. And the agitation goes out to the people so that they are confused. It is a time of great confusion. The confusion is not, does not have a reasonable foundation because for three and a half years he has performed miracle after miracle. He has repeated time and time again that he is God and the Son of God and that he does the works of his Father and that I and the Father are one. And they know what he means, but they're so filled with anger and they're so filled with hate and they're so immersed in sin that they cannot understand. Then Augustine says, their wickedness is so deep that though he speaks plainly, they do not understand. And though they understand, they don't understand at the same time. They know that he says he's God, but they can't believe that he means it. And they see that he does the works of his Father, which means he must be God. And that's why our Lord says to him, if you don't believe my words, believe the works. And if you don't believe my works, you cannot believe my words, for the works confirm the words. And St. Thomas points out, this is the reason for miracles. They're called motives of credibility. The works confirm the words. And why the church teaches that there can be no miracles, no true miracles outside of the true religion. There can be no true miracles outside of God. All those opposed miracles done, for instance, in the Old Testament by the wicked priests of the Pharaoh, they did miracles throwing snakes upon the ground, but they are false miracles, which is to prove that, therefore Aaron's snake ate their two snakes. There were deceptions and false miracles. So it's like there's false miracles in the New Mass, and false miracles in many pagan religions, and many lies of miracles, but true miracles, true works, confirm the words. And Christ says this by the Holy Ghost in the Gospel today. My works confirm the words. And if you do not believe my words, believe the works which confirm the words. The works determine the truth of the words. That he's truly God. And that he has power. Now he shows his power in two ways in this great fight. In the first way, they want to kill him and they're using all their power to kill him. It is not his time to die. Therefore, they shall not harm him. He shows his power in a second way. Since they cannot kill Christ himself, they try to kill his friends. They try to destroy his friends, but he protects them. And that's why he says in the gospel today, that not one shall be plucked out of my hand. I have held in my hand my sheep. This is chapter 10, where it's the same chapter, a few verses earlier, is where our Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the good shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me. And he says here, continuing the same chapter, you do not believe in my works, you do not believe in my words, because you are not of my sheep. But my sheep see, my sheep hear, and my sheep follow me, and not one of them shall be plucked out of my hand. Remember when St. Tarsisius, one of the pagans of the Blessed Sacrament, he was sent by the Pope in order to carry the Blessed Sacrament to the prisoners. He was an acolyte. And as he went, he was holding our Lord Jesus Christ in his hands. In the Blessed Sacrament, and Roman boy said, what do you have? And he would not say, and they killed him. And when he was dead, they tried to pull out of his hands what was inside of them. They used all their might to open his hands, and they could not do it. And so it is with Christ when he says that my, I will have my sheep in my hands, and not one shall be plucked out of my hand, for I and the Father are one. And then St. Augustine says, we have the hand of the Father, who is the Son. We have the hand of the Son, which is the same as the hand of the Father, for he is God. And he is one in nature with the Father. And therefore he has one hand. And the Son is the same as the Father. He has one hand. And the Father is the same as the Son. And he has one hand. It is the hand of the Father. 
It is the hand of the Son. It is the hand of the Holy Ghost. It is a triple hand. And nothing shall be plucked out of this hand. No one shall be harmed who remains in the hand of God. And here is where God shows his great power in our present battle. Those who know him deep in faith, those who love him with all their hearts, and those who learn the wisdom at least of St. Peter when he stood in that desert and Christ prophesied the blessed sacrament. And he said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he did not understand and there were 5,000 people, men, 20,000 people all together, and they all left disgusted by this cannibalism of Christ. And our Lord turned to the apostles and said, Will you leave me also? And St. Peter said wisely, Lord, to whom shall we go? There is no other place to go. And this is the wisdom of this time of the battle. When will it end? Some say it's going on too long. Remember when they said that in the town of Bethulia, two years they were under a siege, and the soldiers could no longer lift their swords, and they were starving and standing on the walls, and there were not enough soldiers to even hold the walls, to even pretend like they could hold the walls, and when Holofernes would attack, they couldn't even lift their swords off the walls. They couldn't even move their swords, they were so weak, and they were supposed to defend the city. And the wise men of Bethulia gathered together, and they said, we cannot defend the walls. We have sent for reinforcements. And they say, all the other 11 tribes tell us they cannot come and help us. We'll have to take care of ourselves. We are over two years in the siege. We are dying of starvation. We are wounded every time they attack the walls. And one more attack, and we cannot hold the attack. Therefore, we give God five days. And if he does not answer our prayers, five days, we will surrender as a sign from heaven. And that was when Judith came out. She was a widow seven years in her widowhood, and she was praying and fasting in her room. And the young widow came out and said, what is this prayer? You do not set time limits on God. You do not question the power of God. Do you not have a memory? Here, Bethulia, in the town of Bethulia, the young widow Judith taught them catechism. Do you not have a memory? Don't you remember that our people were backed up against the Red Sea? And there was a large army on the other side, but God opened the sea. Don't you remember that they were in the desert? And when they were in the desert, there was no food, but manna came from heaven. Do you not remember the 40,000 soldiers of Sennacherib who were going to kill our people until an angel came in the night and killed all of them? Do you not remember the angel of death that visited the city of, of Egypt and killed every firstborn of every man, every firstborn of every beast, that our people might go out of the city of Egypt, the land of Egypt, in glory? Do you not remember these things? God has saved the prophets. He saved Jacob from the hand of Esau. He saved everyone. And how dare you question his power to save us because we've only been two years in a siege. Do we need a soldier's sword? He doesn't have to lift his sword. He has to believe in the Lord. And therefore, this prayer brings down a curse from heaven. And many souls say this kind of prayer today. One such soul, remember a priest in 1988, and he said, I am praying. He was a some priest in Europe. He said, I am praying that our sister Lefebvre not bring a schism to the church. We need to, we, he should not bring a schism to the church by this consecration. And so I am praying that God, in his mercy, kill our sister Lefebvre before June the 30th, 1988, in order to save the church. And that priest died before June 30th. The prayer was answered in a way he did not expect. We don't set time limits on God. We work in confidence according to his plan. We work with confidence according to what he wishes. Can we survive another day? Can we survive another week? 
Not only can we survive, we cannot be stopped. Not only can we not be stopped, nothing can prevent us. Veronica, on that day of the crucifixion, she saw the face of Christ. She saw the sorrowful face. She saw that face bleeding. And she went to adorn that face. She went to take and give some comfort to that face and, and, and give a little comfort to Christ on his way of crucifixion. And there were soldiers in the way. And there was an angry mob in the way. And there was great violence in the way. But she could not be stopped. Because God's power is always complete. And he shall not be stopped. And we must remember in our present battle. A soul that wants to go and comfort the face of Christ. In this great crisis. Cannot be stopped by soldiers. Cannot be stopped by Caiaphas. Cannot be stopped by wicked men. Therefore Veronica went and took a cloth and wiped the face of our Lord. And he left upon it his most magnificent countenance. And he gave to her a gift that still is there in this world today, 2,000 years later. And so he gave a gift. And here it is now we're in the time of the crucifixion of Christ right now. This is the time when we need Veronica. This is the time when we need St. John, who doesn't even know what he should know, but at least he has the wisdom to know the safest place to be is next to Christ. He got through the guards. He let Peter in the garden. And John had the wisdom to know that even though Christ is going to die, even though there doesn't seem to be any hope, there's no safer place to be than next to him. And St. John's hair was not hurt. St. John experienced not the slightest physical discomfort, though his heart was broken. And he stood at the foot of the cross with the Blessed Virgin Mary. And in our present fight, our Lord Jesus Christ says, I have held each sheep in my hand. Not one shall be plucked out. Let them shoot their bullets. Let them attack with their laws. Let them try to throw us in prison. Let them do whatever wicked things they wish. It is not the time. It is not the time. And therefore, they shall not succeed. They shall not succeed. When the time comes, we shall go with glory to our death. But this is not the time. Now is the time when we must have confidence in Christ, in his divine power. Therefore, our Lord stands up with power amidst his enemies. They're about to stone him. And remember on Holy Thursday night, he said, Lord, I thank thee that not one of these little ones is going to be hurt. Not one. He made sure, for instance, that Malchus, who was his enemy, had his ear healed. He made sure that Peter, who pulled out a sword, was not harmed by that wicked mob who wanted to kill Peter. He made sure that the other apostles were all in comfort, and even Judas was no way harmed until Judas decided to kill himself by the wicked act of suicide. But the fact is that no one who believed in him, no one that followed him was harmed. And the holy woman stood safely afar off. The Blessed Virgin stood safely at the foot of the cross. And so John, St. John stood safely at the foot of the cross. Peter safely went in. And one wisely denied him three times. Ran out and wept bitterly. And at no point was he harmed. For as, our, as the fathers tell us, as St. Paul says, where sin did abound, grace doth more abound. So we see sin abounding in our world. We see souls turning away from the truth. We see souls not following the way of God. Souls turning away from the life that they should be following. Priests and bishops of tradition, the Pope, and all, and all turning away from God, trying to find some other solution. And not believing in the power of God. Not believing in his power. Remember Daniel, David. David was told he was going to be a king. David was anointed. And he wisely knew he was not in danger. Therefore he did bold things. When they, they Saul was about to kill him. And he saw that Saul and Abner and his soldiers were asleep. David went down into the camp. He went over the sleeping soldiers without the slightest fear. He took the sword of Saul and he brought it up to the top of the cliff and then he woke them all up. And he said, what kind of guards do you have, Saul? How did I get your sword? How did I 
get it. And without the slightest fear, he woke them up. Without the slightest fear, he went into the camp. You're not supposed to do that. It says, doesn't it say in the scripture, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God? Well, there must be exceptions. David did. And what about St. Teresa? It was not her time to die, but she went to be martyred. What about St. Anthony? He said, I'll become a Franciscan on the condition that I get to be martyred. If you can't guarantee my martyr, martyrdom, I don't want to be one of those brown habited Franciscans. They said, no problem, we can arrange your death. Join us. And so he became a Franciscan. They said, all you got to do is cross a little bitty creek, the, the, the cross over the, the Gibraltar, and head over to Africa, and don't worry, they'll kill you over there. And so he got in a boat on a 20-minute ride across the sea, or a few hours ride, and there came a storm, and he didn't make it because it was not yet his time. And the storm carried him a thousand miles away to Italy, slightly off course. And he got off and became the greatest preacher in the history of the Catholic Church. But if he didn't have the heart to die, if he didn't have the heart to go to death, if he was not afraid, these things could not have happened to him. God protected him because it was not his time. And so it is. He determines the time. And we are never in danger. We are never in the slightest danger. Very often, foolishly, we are afraid. Often afraid because we might be stopped by the police. Often afraid because we might be attacked by the enemies of God and they might get us. Often afraid because we're not sure what's going to happen if we say the right thing and say the truth. We're not sure what's going to happen if we stand for what's right. But that's because we are weak and because we are fools. But not one of the sheep that is in the hand of God, not one shall be plucked out. They tried to pluck the host out of Tarsisius' hand, and it was impossible, and that was the hand of a boy. How is it possible to pluck any sheep out of the hand of God? If only we have confidence. This is our problem. We don't have confidence. We're afraid of the synagogue. We're afraid of the authorities. We're afraid of what people think. We're afraid of our own weakness. We're afraid of our own foolishness. When we should only fear God. And we should have a complete confidence that if we know Him with our faith that's deep, if we love Him with all our hearts, and if we strive to serve Him, we cannot be harmed. We cannot be harmed. Not one of the sheep is going to be pulled out of the hand of God. And so He speaks. They pick up stones to cast at Him. Not one stone leaves their hand. He simply stares at them, and the stones drop. He escapes from their midst. It says this several times in the Gospel. Did he run? No. He walked. He escaped from their midst. He walked out. Today is not the day. I do not wish to die today. I do not wish to be stoned today. Therefore I walk out. And you had better open the door, because I don't feel like opening the door today either. Open it. And so he walked out. And he could not be stopped. And he can never be stopped, because God is God. And he's God right now, in 2017. His power is without bounds. And he cannot be stopped. If Bishop Filet decides to step away from God, it doesn't mean that we must do the same. If Bishop of Rome decides to step away from God, it does not mean we must do the same. If the authorities more and more step away from God in all the various levels, that does not mean we need to do the same. If they put threats down upon us, they cannot harm us. They cannot cause us even the slightest bit of difficulty or harm. So long as we have faith, so long as we stay inside of the hand of God, and what did our Lord say in the Gospel today? I know mine. Mind know me. My sheep know my voice. We have to tune our ears. What is the voice of the shepherd? What does that voice sound like? Let us tune our ears to the voice of the shepherd, hear his voice, and follow him. He will always make sure that there are human shepherds, priests of God, in the world, who will be the representatives of his divine truth. We must be those shepherds. And they will make sure. That if we are truly the representatives of the divine truth, the sheep will hear. There will be a sheep here, another sheep way over there, 
The sheep who have the heart. The sheep who want the faith. The sheep who want the divine truth. The sheep that truly believe that no matter how wicked the world becomes, no matter how many so souls join the wickedness of the devil, no matter how many join the army of Satan, God's army is more powerful. God's ways shall never be stopped. And therefore, we have confidence. And so our Lord did allow that the devil be released for a hundred years, more or less, with a greater power. But he will show an even greater power, for he is going to show his infinite power that God is God. And when they want to destroy our church, though they cause wounds everywhere, it shall never be destroyed. And when they want to destroy a soul that follows Christ, it shall never be destroyed. And whenever the time comes, like St. Joan of Arc, when the time comes that we must go to martyrdom, it shall be on God's schedule, and it shall be for our, our, the glory of Him, and our own glory, and the conversion of any souls, and it shall be a defeat of Satan. And so we shall have nothing to fear if we only remain faithful. We ask the grace to remain faithful, as the wise Judith did, symbol of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And then they made repentance of their false prayer of making a schedule for God to those wicked, to those priests of Bethulia, the wise men of Bethulia. They repented of their foolish prayer of setting a time limit to God. And then Judith went out into the camp of Polyphernes and cut off his head. And they didn't have to wait five days. In only one day, in only one day, Polyphernes was destroyed. And all that was necessary is they make the right act of faith. All that was necessary is they say the right prayer and have the right heart. And so it is in our present crisis of the church. Our Lord is waiting for some souls to have the right prayer, for some souls to have the right heart, for some souls to have the correct deep faith. And then the Blessed Virgin Mary's heel shall cross the head of Satan. And then the Lord Jesus Christ will have his great victory. The schedule is based on the saints. The schedule is based on those who have faith. The schedule is based upon God and upon his Holy Mother. It has nothing to do with those wicked fools who want our death at all times. That's why it says in the Gospel yesterday, your time is always, you're always ready. You're always ready to destroy. You're always ready to, to, to do all manner of evil, to lie, to do whatever wickedness. You're all, your time is always. My time is not yet. And what time matters? My time. I don't care about your time. It shall be brought to an end for all eternity. And that time that you're always ready, but you'll never achieve what you want. You'll never get what you want. You shall be in a state of, state of total and eternal despair. All those that are not in the hand of God. But those that are in the hand of God, and those that enter into his hand, have nothing to fear. And so let's pray that we enter his hand, stay in his hand, always faithful, with a confidence in him and his holy mother. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.